Good afternoon, everyone. We will be starting shortly. Uh, we have uh, a lot of attendees that already have joined in. Uh, we remind you that we have an interpreter. So if you want to use that, just click on the world icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen uh, to activate that. Buenas tardes con todos. Eh, ya se están sumando los invitados. Eh, si quieren utilizar la funcionalidad de traducción simultánea, utilicen el icono en forma de mundo que está en la parte inferior de la ventana del Zoom. Eh, ya voy a activar la cámara y vamos a empezar la sesión dirigida por Hans. Dear Roll, dear members of the Charles Darwin Foundation General Assembly, first and foremost, a warm welcome. Nice to see you all here in these unpredictable times. It is with great pleasure that I introduce you to Rakan Zahawi, our new executive director. A textbook job was done by our selection committee, overviewed by our board member Mark. Bauman, and Zach was our unanimous choice. This is a great and relevant resume, including uh, bachelor's, master's, PhD, uh, and on top of that, his master's field work was carried out in Northwestern Ecuador, so um, he knows the place. I'm sure that after our today's introduction, you will understand why we are so happy that Zach decided to join the Charles Darwin Foundation. Next, I want to introduce you to Frank Cessno, who will facilitate today's meeting. Me being, so to speak, a first generation CNN viewer, Frank is one of those people that in a way I have known all of my life. When Daryl Schuling brought up the idea of this town hall and suggested Frank as the facilitator of this meeting, to me, this was a no-brainer. To name just a few of the relevant items on Frank's long and distinguished CV, CNN Washington Bureau Chief, environmental storytelling, interviewing scientists, and not to forget a long history with Ecuador and the Galapagos. Frank, over to you. Well, Hans, thank you very much. And Zach, greetings to you. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Hans, for that lovely introduction. Great to be here. Well, it's it's great to be with you, although I wish we were really with you. And for those who are joining from around the world, I'm sure that's a sentiment we all share. Uh, I will share that I'm coming from my library in Washington, D.C. Zach, why don't you tell people where you are sitting right now so they get a sense of your environment? Yeah, well, we're in Puerto Ayora in our conference center in, in, at the Charles Darwin Foundation. Uh, I'm imagining that many of you on this, on this webinar have uh, um, been here before. So well, that's where we are. Yeah. I'm sure they have and look forward to doing it again, as have I and as do I. <laughs> uh, so for the purposes of our conversation over the next hour, um, I, I, we want to explore with Zach where he's come from, uh, what excites him about doing this job now, what he sees ahead as the, both the tasks and the challenges, uh, get to know him and your questions too, and you'll see instructions in the chat, but if you have a question, please feel free to put it into the Q&A and we'll get to those in a little bit. So Zach, why don't we start with your remarkable and interesting history. You are truly a citizen of the world um, and perhaps you can share with people a bit of your biography that is so relevant to what you're doing now and um, some of your travels and, uh, and studies over your life. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I am. Uh, I always say sort of I'm that this is always one of the toughest questions for me to answer. And uh, I can do a short version or a long version. But the, the reason being that I grew up uh, in many different countries. Um, so I was born in Lebanon. My parents are actually uh, Iraqi of origin, um, and but I also lived as a, 
in you know my growing up years uh, in Yemen, in France. Uh, I was in boarding school in Ireland, and then um, in the U.S. I went to undergraduate at the University of Texas, uh, and then graduate school at the University of Illinois. And thereafter, have spent almost my entire career in in Latin America, um, working uh, in in uh, restoration ecology. So, um, you know, to me, my background is a little bit of all of these places. So you speak several languages, I'm sure, including Texas. <laughs> <laughs> I can speak Texas. Um, uh, yeah, I do. I speak uh, Arabic. Um, like a kid, and I mix up both dialects of Lebanese and, and Iraqi, um, which are pretty distinct. So people get very confused as to my my origins when I when I speak Arabic. Um, but I also speak uh, French uh, and Italian, in addition to to Spanish, of course. So Zach, in in all these travels, and as we think about your trajectory and where you are now and where you'll be going, where did your interest in science come from? Where did that start? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, my mother was an archaeologist um, and worked most of her, her life uh, in, in uh, the Middle East, uh, 25 years of which were in Yemen. So I was often in really remote locations in, uh, during my, my childhood in spectacular places. It just seemed normal to me, but obviously it was very distinct to most uh, kids' upbringing. Um, and so I, I learned to appreciate the, just the outdoor environment from, from a really young age, uh, even though you know, her focus was more on, on sort of the, you know, on, on archeology span and, and um, ancient, ancient sites, pre-Islamic sites. But uh, I actually went into undergraduate not really knowing what I wanted to do, except that it would be an outdoor component and went into geology to start off with. Um, and it was when I was finishing a pretty mediocre degree in geology and, and took an elective course in, in uh, uh, plant taxonomy with a, actually a, a, a Colombian professor, visiting professor at UT Austin and uh, it was native plants of Texas. I mean, that was the first time I, a course actually, you know, knocked me off of my feet. Uh, and that was sort of the beginning of, of my interest in biology. And I think this speaks to my plant bias as a, as a scientist, because the, the reason I didn't go into biology to begin with, you know, I mean, obviously we were exposed to it in, in, in boarding school and high school, um, is the focus is always on on animals and on um, uh, cell biology and and things like that. Ecology gets maybe a, a you know a sliver of a chapter, and you get to learn what a tundra system is and what a temperate system is, and and that's the end of it. And so th there was no exposure until I stumbled into that class and realized that there's you know a lot more to to that world than that that field. Um, well, I, think, I think everybody's very glad that you stumbled as you did. Um, mm -hmm. You most recently come from um, uh, Hawaii, where you were uh, the director of the uh, Leon Lion Arboretum at the university there. For that, you were at the uh, your director of the Las Cruces Research Station in Costa Rica. So what is the professional arc that brings you to Charles, the Charles Darwin Foundation? Right, so uh, that to pick up from that course I took, I finished my undergraduate degree and then again by chance uh, had a friend or have a friend who, close friend who dragged me down to Mexico and Central America, um, just visiting and that exposed me to tropical systems and that then sent me on this next trajectory where I volunteered on a couple of projects uh, as uh, in between my undergraduate and graduate, um, <clears throat> and then went on to pursue a, a master's and PhD uh, in Illinois, working first in, in Ecuador in Maquipucuna for my master's and then in Honduras for my, my PhD, um, which then 
leads into you know all of my my career choices. So bring us from bring us from Costa Rica to Hawaii to Charles Darwin. How did you? Sure. So, how did you end up here? Yeah, um, I took. Uh, Right, right when I was finishing my PhD, I was offered a position with the Organization for Tropical Studies in, in Costa Rica. Um, and first, I, the first position I held with OTS was uh, uh, as one of the professors of their undergraduate program. So basically, we were three faculty roaming around Costa Rica, uh, exposing students to uh, the different habitats and unique systems that that are in in Costa Rica and hands on field course basically for an entire semester I did that for for essentially three years and then the position opened up uh, at Las Cruces and it was one of the field stations we used to visit uh, with the courses and that was of all the stations we visited in in Costa Rica, that was the one that I always led uh, as a coordinator for the for the course and also the one that was most dear to me and the one I had a real felt that I had a real vision for so I applied for the position and obviously I, I got that position and I was there for for close to 11 years um, mm. and uh, so it was a it was a pretty long long stint as director of, of uh, that that uh, field station um, there was a short stint in between that um, and Hawaii uh, teaching uh, ecology and at, at the University of Utah and Lebanon, and then and then I got the position at, at the University of Hawaii uh, in I guess it was 2017, and I was there there for four years or close to four years. I actually wasn't planning on moving anytime soon. I knew I would be coming back to the neotropics at some point because. That's my entire career, and all my research is is based in in Latin America. Um, so you know, I was sort of a little bit out of sorts in Hawaii, but uh, I was very well established there and and liked my position. But of course, um, this opportunity is uh, as you know, it's an obvious statement to say it's a really unique uh, opportunity, and and you know, it was difficult to sort of say okay i'm going to turn my life upside down again all over again for only four years after going to hawaii but uh i did and i'm very sure. happy to have done so, so what, what was it about this job zach what is it about this place that so appealed to you certainly it's back in latin america but it's 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 a little removed you know you're 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 in the archipelago right so what was it about the charles darwin foundation what it's doing, what it needs to do that, that, that drew your attention and your interest in such an intense way. Yeah, I mean, of course, there, there are multiple factors. Back, being back in Latin America was a, was a big piece of it. Um, but of course, uh, Galapagos in of itself was another uh, major piece. I mean, Galapagos is a really unique uh, environment. It's, it's sort of a, a, a bellwether system uh, uh, at some level, uh, and, and then the third and really key piece of this, because, you know, I came down and visited, uh, as, as, uh, you know, basically with the, with the job on offer in the middle of the pandemic, it was, uh, I think in, uh, early October that I came here and what really, uh, captured my attention was the, the energy at the, at the foundation, at the research station uh, of staff, uh, the incredible history uh, in terms of uh, data and research that's been done here over 60 plus years. Um, and yeah, just a, just a real sense that, that there's uh, a lot of drive here and a lot of potential. Uh, and I, you know, one of the one of the more baffling questions that you know I still haven't fully answered, but uh, you know, and, and but but to me is a really interesting one is in all of this potential and and uh, dynamism here. Why is why is CDF not more recognized than uh, than it is? I mean, obviously in in Ecuador, it's it's 
well established as a as a central institution, but um, it's it's not at the level of of Stry, for example, in in Panama. But you know, it actually has more to offer um, than than any other field station I know of, um, because you've got both the terrestrial environment uh, that's incredible, incredible and unique, and then of course the marine environment as well. So, I mean, I think it's a really interesting time that you're going there too, of course. And we're seeing that here in Washington with so much more focus on both climate change and on science broadly. And there's um, a great appetite in the world to know and understand more. So as you think about the Charles Darwin Foundation and that opportunity to you know, expand its influence and its profile, where do you see some of the greatest opportunities at? Well, I mean, the, the, the short answer in my mind is, is CDF, uh, from the way I see it, needs to, to think, think uh, big or think bigger, perhaps, is a better way of, of, uh, of saying it. So, what do you mean by that, that? Well, I mean, I think we, obviously, the central focus has to be uh, Galapagos and what's going on here, um, but it it doesn't hurt to think of Galapagos as part of a bigger system, much like the marine uh, research that goes on here. You look at uh, uh, the reserve, but you also look at the connectivity of it to other island uh, systems uh, here. Uh, likewise, you know, Galapagos has, as, a, as a dot on the landscape in, in the world, it's not gonna do us any good just to protect uh, that archipelago on its own. Uh, we have to think sort of in a broader geographical framework uh, in my uh, I also think a key piece is really scaling up what we do. Um, so, you know, there have been some really major initiatives that, that CDF has been a part of, such as, you know, the Go to Eradication Program was, was a huge undertaking um, back uh, when that was pushed through. But for example, um, I mean, I'm a restoration ecologist, and and to me, you know, there's vast areas of national park here uh, that are hugely degraded, and and so you have habitat here that is quote unquote protected, but is protected protecting what? Um, it's not really suitable habitat for the emblematic species that are here. So we in my mind, really need to be securing funding for large scale uh, restoration efforts that that's not just a small study where we can say, okay, we can do this to control this species, but we're going to actually uh, apply this across a large area so we have a, a, a bigger impact. So Zach, when I was there, I brought a group of students and we had an opportunity to talk to several of your scientists and really spend a day there. And clearly one of the advantages that CDF has is you have a campus, uh, you have a presence. So how do you see that playing into the future that you're talking about and as, the, as a distinctive advantage of the foundation? Absolutely, that's, that's to me one of the, I mean, it's no surprise to anyone. Obviously today there are multiple organizations working in the Galapagos uh, doing conservation work and it's not, it's not the Galapagos of uh, 20, 30 years ago when CDF was the only gig in town. Um, and so one of the big advantages we have is that we have a campus and then, um, and, and that in terms of infrastructure, in terms of lab space um, and facilities and so on is, is a huge uh, uh, factor that distinguishes us from almost all other uh, 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 organizations working here with the possible exception of, you know, San Francisco, but they're on a different island. Um, the other part of, of having a campus here is, is we're sort of what I would say halfway through uh, a major overhaul on, on the facilities and uh, the inspiration complex, which uh, is right there, almost about to go online um, within, you know, the next month or so. Is, is a huge game changer. Uh, and photographs um, just don't capture it. Uh, I saw photographs of it when I interviewed and it was a, an entirely uh, different um, you know, feeling when I actually came here. There are board members that came 
that have come down for a uh, uh, board meeting tomorrow uh, that that had a first chance to see the 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 building um, in you know more than a year and and were you know basically speechless um, walking around and seeing the the facilities. It's a real game changer, and it doesn't. So what we need to do there is is actually leverage that facility in in two ways in my mind. One is look at sort of marine research as a whole in in Galapagos and see what where are the gaps, what could we actually be doing um, or bringing in using our you know state of the intern lab facilities now at at the at Biomar um, to attract new research. Um, to you know, help further the conservation agenda uh, in in Galapagos, but then also leverage that that facility to raise more more funds. I think you know, donors and and you know foundations will look to that and say, okay, these people have their you know really have something going for themselves. And you know, when you compare that to some of the facilities that haven't been overhaul there's a, it's really quite uh, stunning so if we all come to visit you in two years to the inspiration complex and you <laughs> want to blow us all away like you blew your, your board away what will we be doing there how will you show us how you use the inspiration complex to to go big at cdf well there i mean there are two pieces of the of the complex one is the the marine complex itself which has uh you know, office space, uh, wet and dry labs that are, you know, I mean, before what the marine researchers had was basically, you know, a small closet, if you will, to, to do work in. Now you actually have uh, an entire ground floor uh, of just lab space. So you can, to give you a sense of scale, you could actually have an entire course there doing work um, and doing uh, lab uh Analyses and uh, or or taking part in in some kind of program. That's that's one wing of it, and and it's greatly expanded our our what we can do in in marine research. And then the other component is the is the conference center, and you have a, a conference state of the art conference center that's basically right overlooks the 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 bay uh, here in Puerto Ayora. Um, and I'm not sure it's, you know, one handicap of this conference is that, you know, I think attendees will just spend their entire time looking out at the, uh, at the bay and not focus on the, on the talks, but, you know, we have curtains, so, um, but it, it's, it's, it's really a, a big attraction to potentially draw in, um, uh, board, uh, boards from other, uh, companies, corporations, so on. Um, and that's a way to leverage funds that can then further the research that we do. So it's sort of a, a knock-on effect that, that you know, if we, if we organize it uh, coherently and in a good way, will we'll really uh, help propel us forward. You know, Zach, we talked about your background coming from around the world, the languages you speak. Um, the, the, the leadership that you've already exercised in, in, in you know, having run field stations. I think one of the things that, that makes you such a uh, compelling leader of the, of the Charles Darwin Foundation is that you cross these cultures, you've got experience bringing people together, um, you've brought people together in, in conservation. How do you envision bringing people together in different or bigger ways into, the, the, into CDF to, to kind of um, advance these goals that you're talking about. You look to yeah, uh, I, thinking of new partnerships, new collaborations, if so, where, what, what are you thinking in these still early days? Yeah, it's, it's early for sure, but I have actually been, been moving in that, in that direction. Um, we already had uh, a couple of universities visit, uh, in the, in my time, uh, who would be new partners, um, and looking for ways ways to collaborate, um, I think there I think there are two two key pieces of that. One is is reaching out to um, other institutions uh, in the U.S. and in Europe, and and obviously uh, on in Ecuador and in other parts of Latin America. Indeed, 
the, the two that have approached us so far are both from, one from Ecuador and one from, from Colombia. Um, but I think that's really an, uh, an under, uh, underutilized component of, of building, building relationships. And, and you know, CDF has, has a number of, of uh, long-term uh, collaborations, but it's, you know, Galapagos is, is a really special place. You, you talk to any biologist and, and, you know, their eyes glaze over. It's uh, mine included, you know, before and even after coming here. It's, so it's got that, it's got that uh, cachet that, that is, is, you know, you can't replicate almost anywhere else in the world. And so we, in my mind, really don't use that to our advantage to, to build these, these collaborations with, with organizations of, uh, abroad. And so one I'm really focused on is, is the University of Hawaii where I, just, where I just left because I still have connections there. I have an affiliation there. Uh, I'm, I know the provost, I know various deans. Uh, and so the idea in my mind is to try and build a, a strong connection there because uh, if, you know, you, you were to pick any university in the U.S. that would be a natural um, ally or, or partner with, with CDF, that would be it, because it's also on a, you know, volcanic archipelago in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It's a tropical system. They deal with invasive species. They deal with lots of endemic species. Um, they have all kinds of similar challenges uh, with, you know, with tourism, what have you. So it's, it's really a natural fit. Um, and the information can go both ways. So it's not just a, a siphoning in one direction. Um, so that's the outside. The inside part, I think, is, is another really big piece. And that's really trying to build stronger connections with um, uh, local uh, organizations, NGOs, uh, Universidad San Francisco de Quito, uh, Universidad Central that are all sort of, I mean, Central is coming in now. Um, and, you know, I don't think we're going to advance the conservation agenda uh, as much as we want to in Galapagos if we don't work together. And there's too much elbowing uh, going on and nudging uh, from, you know, me coming in as an outsider, outsider um, at this point. So I think that's a really big focus of. I want to, let me follow up on that for a minute and some of the situational things you've got around. And then I have a couple of questions closer to Las Noticias that I want to ask you about, okay? So first okay. is, um, and it's something you just mentioned. Um, you have a very interesting challenge because you're, the, you know, the foundation is located and you're now living in amidst a, a population that's in the middle of a national park in the midst of a world heritage site. And I wonder how you see both the challenges and the opportunities around the importance of the people you're, you're, you're living with and interacting and how that corresponds to the success of CDF and what you're doing. Yeah, I, I think that's a, another excellent question and, and, and new line, uh, uh, or more recent line of, of research that, that CDF has really started uh, getting into. And I, and I fully support it. So looking at socioeconomic aspects uh, of, uh, and how that ties into uh, research and, and conservation is, is um, really a, a, a key piece in this. So I'm a restoration ecologist. I've worked in, 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 this, in this field for, 25 plus years and restoration ecology is, is very much science in terms of what you do on the ground. But if you don't incorporate the, the human element into this, you're essentially wasting your time. I mean, there, there has to be an understanding of what are the driving forces there uh, and what are the needs of, uh, of the community um, and, and why you are where you are in the system and looking at ways to find that, that balance. And likewise, in, in the last you have the you have the same thing, and of course, you know. I mean, the the fisheries uh, dynamic is is a great example of that. Um, and so, you know, our our research here is branching out to to incorporate um, uh, the the human dimension 
uh, in, in as much as possible. And fisheries is probably the, the, the biggest sort of research avenue where that's, that's really- what, what, are, what are you looking at exactly? What are you talking about there? What's the connection? Uh, well, they're looking at, at mechanisms to uh, assess sort of, uh, or, or develop ways for sustainable uh, fisheries uh, in the Galapagos, in the reserve. Um, it involves uh, multiple stakeholders. So you're not just coming at it with a set of instructions that you're, that you're telling people this is how it's going to work. It's, it, it's through multiple workshops, multiple, you know, uh, it, it's, a, it's a long uh, process that, that comes at uh, sort of these big overarching questions um, to try and address sort of the needs of what the local population uh, are looking for, and uh, also obviously trying to um, maximize conservation. Um, okay. So let me uh, ask some, some, newsy, some newsy questions, and then I'm gonna go to the questions from the audience in a few minutes, if that's okay. How are you sure. doing on vaccines? Uh, how are you doing at uh, CDF, uh, the larger, you know, the Galapagos in general? How does that affect the way you're now able to do business and meet or not? Yeah, I think that's, we're we're very lucky here. So um, Galapagos at this point is is over 70, 80 percent uh, uh, vaccinated. So 80, probably 80? higher than really. Yeah. Of, now is that yeah. the entire? What is that? Eighteen up, twelve up. What's the uh, over sixteen? I believe. Wow, um, that's great. And, and and you know that was the the previous administration decided to focus their uh, to, to sort of try and, and, and pull Galapagos out of the, the pandemic, um, you know, dynamic in the sense that it's a, it's a small population. Uh, it's a huge economic engine for both Galapagos, but also for the country. And, and getting that going was, was really important. So and we an were, island population, so you can take advantage of the fact that it's an island and really Exactly. And, and so you're talking 30,000 plus people here. Um, and, you know, the vast majority of them are now vaccinated. And, and obviously, same goes for, for CDF. Um, uh, almost all staff are, are, are vaccinated. They're That's just. Right. So are you meeting? Are you back meeting face to face and have a little bit more kind of confidence and freedom? Exactly. Um, I, I mean, we're all, we, we're all, I mean, obviously I'm not wearing a mask right now, but typically in our, we, we, we all still wear masks, uh, even though we're all vaccinated, you know, we, there's the, the science is still not conclusive as to whether you can, you know, be a, a carrier, um, even if you're vaccinated and, and inadvertently affect, uh, infect somebody else. <clears throat> So, so we do wear uh, masks, but we have in-person meetings. A lot. Uh, I mean, everybody at CDF here is is uh, almost everybody's working in person. Um, so. Okay. So the next question. Now that everybody's vaccinated, we can be doing all kinds of great things. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio made some news recently <laughs> by uh, announcing forty-three million dollars, a forty-three million dollar initiative to rewild the Galapagos. DiCaprio calls it one of the most irreplaceable spots on the planet. So thanks, Leonardo. Uh, does that have an impact on you and CDF? Uh, well, of course. I mean, it has an impact on Galapagos. So by extension, it, it affects what we do. That's a, a very recent uh, announcement. Um, and so we don't know all the details as yet, but my understanding that some of those funds will be directed to a couple of the long-term projects that tie into rewilding um, in Galapagos, namely uh, the Falornis uh, project, uh, and then also uh, potentially the uh, Scalacia project, restoration project. So, so it, it could have significant um, ramifications for us. Uh, but that's, you know, to me, I mean, that's a huge injection of, of money into Galapagos. It, it got great publicity, put us on, uh, on the map. That's exactly the kind of funding we need to be looking for as a foundation. 
um, you know, maybe 43 million would be fantastic, but even I'd be happy with, with five or 10. So, you know, we, we, we need we'll to, to work be looking for that. Yeah, we can work with, we, we can work with that. So, um, but I mean, it must, be a big, it must be a big deal and it must, you know, cross your mind in many ways as you're thinking about the partnerships you want to build, the trajectory of CDF. When someone of DiCaprio's stature calls out the Galapagos in such an important way, you know, commits that kind of money. I mean, people who know the Galapagos know the Galapagos and people who understand it, but many, many people do not. Obviously, that's, that's probably not the main audience that you're concerned with. You're more concerned with the science audience and with the research audience and that kind of thing. But I, 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 would, I would imagine, Zach, that this is something that has both a practical effect with some of the money, as you discussed, but also um, kind of an intangible effect when someone of that stature invokes this very special place that you're so connected to. Do you mean so uh, uh, an impact on, on Leonardo or? No, 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 no. An impact on the public and a, a, a kind of a, a, a lever, you know, a, it's an ability for you to leverage your profile in a place that, that others are now increasingly recognizing. Exactly. Exactly. So I think, you know, it, it shines the spotlight back to Galapagos and you can use that, that spotlight to um, highlight some of the, the, the issues that, that are faced here. And that sort of cycles back to my point earlier on in our conversation where to, to me, it, it's, it's, I mean, everybody knows Galapagos the world over, um, but most people don't know what's being done on the ground here in terms of the, the conservation efforts. I mean, okay, so it's a national park, but that's just a, that's just a decree. Um, and lots of national but, parks. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, and, and, but what's being done here on the ground in terms of research and, and trying to, to sort of get at the bottom of some of these big, um, you know, challenging problems is is really fascinating stuff, and and just doesn't get the publicity that it that it should. Um, and so I think that's that's what some of this kind of injection of of cash and sort of pizzazz that you know flying around the news um, helps helps sort of foment and 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 uh, you know bring around. So I think I think it's a it's a really good opportunity, and you know where. We're looking at a couple of, of leads ourselves that, that would be significant funding too. And, you know, is it coincidence? Is it, you know, who knows why these other interests are, are popping up now? Um, it, it, it could have something to do with the, you know, the news that's flashing around. So, you know, okay, fund so, me, so on the news, let me ask you another one. This is closer to home. And you may want to be very careful with your answer to this, or maybe not, depending. <laughs> but you have, okay. a new, you have a new governor. This is Ecuadorian politics, right? But you have a new governor. So what's the effect of that? Have you, have you met? Have you talked? Uh, do you get a sense that your work is a, is a priority item? Uh, we have not met yet. So, um, you know, I, uh, I do need to be careful with my, the way I answer this question. But um, uh, that... That is an important step that will hopefully happen in the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, I think there's still some um, processing going on in terms of the appointment um, and and when that becomes official and and you know when he comes to uh, Puerto Ayora and 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 we can meet. But you know I government relations and relations with with organizations that was one of the more striking things i experienced in my first couple of weeks when i took took on the job where i think day two or day three i met the pres the, the then president uh, of ecuador um and you know also went and met several ministers uh, and you know the, there was a big focus uh, by CDF uh, staff who you know sort of organized my introduction, if you will, to look outward first. And I thought that was a really interesting approach, and also underscores the importance of those those relations and, and making sure those are, are are you know really solid. Zach, can I come back to the pandemic for just a moment? Uh, 
because I, I, I want to ask you what effect before everybody got vaccinated, the pandemic had on the science that was going on there and the scientific projects. What was the effect? What was the effect of this last very strange year and some? Yeah, um, I mean, obviously, I wasn't here, uh, but Galapagos, just like anywhere else, completely shut down, uh, and the park basically uh, shut down all field work. And so there were a number of crazy stories of of researchers stuck in extremely remote places, unaware of the world falling apart around them, um, and and having to be sort of pulled out of there and brought back to Puerto Ayora or, or, or go back to their home country or what have you. So probably I want to say nine months maybe or so, there was little to no field work going on. And for some projects, you know, as, as science is, you know, it's very varied. Some projects, it, it didn't have that much of an impact to lose a field season essentially, but other projects are really critical. Um, and you know, at a real delicate uh, point in terms of uh, you know, highly endangered species and so on. And so to lose a year of, of being able to go on the field and do monitoring or, or, or controls or what have you was, was uh, a huge setback. Um, mm -hmm. but, but, but most of the projects at this point are back up and running, um, and and uh, and yeah, there's been a flurry of activity of, of you know PIs going back out in the field. It's very good to hear. Let me just uh, remind um, the participants and and our, our folks who are joining us that if you have a question for Zach, go ahead and put it in the Q and A, and I will I will get to that and try to uh, put uh, several questions to Zach here as we spend the next. Uh, uh, 10 or 15 minutes or so uh, in, in our conversation. Zach, there is one here that I see. Uh, Fritz is asking what the situation is around uh, uh, Puerto Ceballos and the protection of the bird colonies there. Do you have information on that? I do not have the latest updates on that. I know that's been going back and forth, but I don't have uh, updates on that one. Okay, fair enough. What about... Um, uh, oh, here's one that's just come across an observation. This is from Sylvia rather than a question, but perhaps you can comment on it, uh, which is uh, <clears throat> Sylvia's sincere hope that collaborating scientists will be able to have a higher level of impact, input with management decisions being taken by the park. Uh, good luck to both institutions, she says. But do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I think that's a really great, great question. Um, it's it's a it's a it's it's a tricky dynamic today because there's so many other institutions working uh, in conservation in, in Galapagos. Um, but you know we remain the only institution that's essentially attached at the hip to the to the park. Um, and uh, to me, it's key to to strengthen that that relationship and to really uh, or, or make them more aware that, you know, where they're, where they're principal ally. Uh, and that goes back to having the campus here. That goes back to us being the custodians of all the collections of Galapagos. I mean, we're really sort of um, an, uh, a, the research wing of, uh, of, of the, you know, the park system, even though we're independent and we're not a, a, a governmental uh, body. Uh, and so really, to me, strengthening that is, is key. And, you know, I think uh, it's, it's, again, it goes back to sort of my first few weeks here, where it was all trying to meet different ministers and really trying to build these relations, of course, then promptly the government changed. So we have to basically start all over again. But I think, um, I think we need to, you know, do that again. And I have, you know, a series of, of meetings in Quito uh, next month, um, and of course the governor here, and, and you know if the park directorate changes, um, it's sort of still up in the air. Then um, I would go and, and meet the new park director. So there's a bit of a follow-up here from Isabella, who asks uh, whether, you know, with respect to your relations with the national park officials, and whether specifically they're accepting <laughs> the advice from the park in their fishery decisions. 
Um, so, I mean, it's the park's decision as to how to act on um, recommendations made by uh, CDF or by any other organization. So um, I know uh, that the, you know, Sea Cucumber uh, has been uh, reauthorized for, for, for fishing starting, I don't remember what the date is, but, but it's upcoming. Um, and the actual recommendation of, of CDF was, you know, you're, you're just above the minimal, minimum threshold here. So it's advisable not to do that, but- You were saying uh, hold off on this. Hold off, but you know, the pressures are such that, um, you know, and the pandemic plays a big role in this too, right? So, you know, uh, people's, people's livelihoods have been really strongly impacted by this. So there's this, this push and pull by, by different actors and, and you know, what we can do is, is provide the information and give our recommendation. We are ultimately not the, not the, arc, uh, you know, the, the decision makers in, in that process. I want to point out, by the way, that question came from Macarena. So just to give uh, credit okay. to do for that question. Another one uh, from the audience, how can we as a community help you with your vision of thinking bigger? Hmm. Here's your big chance, Zach. Go for the swing for the fence. <laughs> well, I mean, think, thinking bigger is going to involve. Uh, it, it's it's not just my ideas. I mean, some of you in the audience here uh, uh, have have years under your belt uh, of exposure to Galapagos, have seen it change, have seen the challenges, and so on. So, I think part of part of thinking bigger is also uh, listening to. Um, other people's suggestions. I've, of course, received many, um, and being part of that process uh, in, you know, for example, the strategic planning that's that's going to be coming up uh, in the upcoming uh, year. Uh, the other, the, the other is really to be uh, spokespersons for for what we do at CDF. Um, I mean, there, we still have uh, a lot of of challenges we face. We still need to improve our infrastructure here uh, and, and that's going to require, you know, fundraising and, and looking for, for new uh, contacts in that realm. So I think, you know, being able to, to see what we do in our operations involves uh, uh, collaborative effort from many uh, of, of anybody who's, who's a, you know, a CDF uh, supporter. Okay, several more questions coming in. Let's try to, I'll try to tick through them quickly so we can get as many as possible. Jeffrey asks, rewilding is essential for ecosystem function, but it's just as important to solve the riddle of Thalornis, a study of which is, a said study says an urgent need of secure uh, funding for the next five years. Will this be a priority? It's absolutely a priority. Um, and, you know, I, I can't, I don't want to jinx the process we're in, but we do have two, two major leads that we're working on that would provide long-term um, funding for uh, Philornis and would allow us to scale up um, rations. Philornis is one wing of, you know, I mean, that's a, a major uh, challenge. Uh, and, and to me, uh, it's, that's one of the more, I mean, that's an incredible, uh, Collaborative effort with you know twenty plus institutions working together to to find a, a, a solution to that. But the other issue is is going back to sort of what I talked about at the beginning. We we actually have to bring back the habitat uh, in many of these areas so that there actually is uh, a place for these rewilded species to go to. Otherwise, um, you're just introducing. You know, I mean, I'm a I'm a plant person, so I'm always going to say you got to have the flora to have the fauna, um, uh, and so you know, it's that that's that's your building block, and without that, you have just a bunch of degraded landscape. And I've spent my you know entire career in degraded landscapes and trying to look at ways to to restore them. Okay, just a couple more here for what we have time for. Here's one: 
You already mentioned this, this is from, again, from, from one of our participants. Uh, you already mentioned this in many places in the world, conservation and science groups tend to compete rather than cooperate. So how do you assess the situation for the Galapagos? And how do you see your strategy with respect to this potential problem? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's probably one of the things that was more shocking to me coming to Galapagos than uh, anything else. I, uh, it's, I've, I've had s several eye-opener, um, not necessarily experiences, but exposure to stories or, or situations um, here. And, and I, I think it goes back to, you know, Galapagos, in order to really move that needle, we have to work together. And I think getting that message across to all the entities that you can't, we can't just try and carve out a, a piece of Galapagos and, and put our sticker and our name on it. It really has to be a collaborative effort, um, whoever those actors are. Otherwise you're just, we're all sort of independently doing a few things here and there, but there has to be a, a, a broader strategy. Um, and, and my argument is that you have whatever it is, 10 organizations, 20 organizations working in Galapagos today. If you crank that up an order of magnitude more, you still wouldn't have enough researchers to address the problems that you're dealing with in Galapagos. Um, you know, the bottleneck of course is, is funding and, and things like that, but, um, it's, it's really key to, to bridge those gaps. And I mean, that's what I've done throughout my career. Um, mm -hmm. I had those problems in Las Cruces as well with, with researchers butting heads uh, uh, when I, you know, about, because, you know, there are two groups of ornithologists, um, two different camps, and they just refused to you know, they were basically competing for the, for the geographic space to work there, and it was absurd. And in the end, they both wound up staying after we sort of managed to work things out, and both um, institutions produced incredible work over, you know, the decade I was there. So you can be the peacemaker, among, among other things, perhaps, here. That's a very challenging problem, because, you know, conflicting personalities, priorities, budgets, uh, all the rest. Okay, a couple quick questions, and, and, and then I'm going to turn this back over to Hans. Uh, I love this one. Have you met Leonardo personally? <laughs> well, I can actually say yes to that. Um, and that was another crazy story, because I think I was in uh, Galapagos for maybe a week um, when I got a random of course, this all happens on WhatsApp. Anybody who's in Ecuador knows that that's the way business is done here. But um, I just got a text message from somebody at Island Conservation saying, please come to, to dinner at you know, one of these lodges that are, that are up in the highlands. And I had no idea who it was. So I, I asked um, Joanna um, you know, whether this was worth worth the, the effort or, or, and she looked at and she said, ooh, that's really interesting. You, you need to go. <laughs> um, and so I went and um, there he was. I mean, uh, you know, eventually he appeared with, alongside several other, of uh, you know, the major funders who are underwriting this, this big initiative. Well, you know, if you're in his next movie, I'll be your agent for your contract. <laughs> <laughs> and make sure that a good portion of that comes to CDF. Uh, Peter, Peter asks on a more serious note, uh, can we do more to strengthen the quarantine system? Um, there's always more you can do to strengthen the quarantine system. I look at the quarantine system here and I'm blown away actually by what is done in Galapagos because I just came from Hawaii and the quarantine system there is you sign a little, little form saying, yeah, I promise I'm not bringing anything in and that's it. Um, and you can bring whatever you want in. In fact, the quarantine in Hawaii is you get apples and oranges confiscated if you're going from Hawaii into the mainland, but not if you're going from the mainland into Hawaii. It makes absolutely no sense. Um, and so Abehe, considering um, where we are and what resources are available has done a remarkable job um, and, and continues to, to you know, try and strengthen 
um, those you know loopholes and so on. But I mean, of course, more can be done. Um, but I, I I still find it uh, very impressive what's done here. That said, you know, every single flight that comes in here, every ship that comes in here adds risk to uh, something coming in and, you know, speaks volumes to moving towards increased sustainability in, in Galapagos, right? So you really want to uh, be self-sufficient in food or largely self-sufficient. That way we're not bringing in fresh produce constantly from right. the mainland right. that can bring some beastie with it. So. Right. Uh, as I said, I want to be mindful of people's time. There are two questions, and I want to get them both. So you, uh, uh, we got this one. You mentioned the eradication of goats. What would be your pet project? And I do like the play on words there, by the way. <laughs> well, it doesn't have to be eradication, right? I mean, the the right. the. What, I, what I've been just completely mesmerized by since I've been in Galapagos are the marine iguanas. And I, I have these strange deviations from the plant world um, <laughs> in, in my career where I was uh, obsessed with bats when I was in Costa Rica and, and worked with several projects in bats. And I think here in, in Galapagos, it's the marine iguanas that have, that have just captured my attention. I think my, my phone has got hundreds of of images of, of marine iguanas that I walk by every morning. So, you know, if I could get involved with a, with a project uh, tied to a to, uh, question around that, I'd be very interested. That'd be, that'd be awesome. Okay, well, I can't think of a better way to end than with Dennis's question here. Be careful how you answer. Probably the fewer <laughs> words, the better. So describe what it's like working with the staff on a regular basis both in science and administratively. Likewise, the board and the General Assembly. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's a big question. Uh, working with the staff has been a pleasure. Um, as I said, that was one of the key factors um, that made me take this, this job. Uh, I think there are some incredible uh, staff working here at all uh, across all departments and uh, levels, um, really dedicated. Some have been here for uh, 20, 30 years, uh, and it's, it's really testimony because uh, as many on this call know, you know, CDF has gone through some pretty turbulent times in its, in its history, uh, and, and, and it speaks volumes to the dedication of, of what's going on here. Um, and you know, uh, with the board, uh, this will, uh, maybe I should answer that question on Thursday because I have uh, the board meeting tomorrow and I'll have a good, a much better sense. But no, in all seriousness, I, I've interacted with almost all board members individually uh, and, you know, each bring a, a, a really interesting set of uh, experiences and skill sets and assets uh, and connections. Um, and that's been a really uh, um, interesting dynamic to work with. Uh, I haven't been in a position where I've worked with a board before, so that's been a that's been new to me. And then uh, with the General Assembly, I've met very few members, but I have met you know maybe a half dozen uh, GA members. So my my exposure has been been limited. This is perhaps I guess the first foray, if you will. Um, and uh, again, you know, I think there's a, a broad breadth of, of uh, people that make up the, the GA uh, and uh, some with deep roots to, to Galapagos. Um, and, you know, I'm really looking forward to meeting. I mean, I've had, I've had multiple email exchanges with, with some, some of whom are on, on this call. So, um, yeah, I, I think, you know, all of that combined, creates enormous potential for this institution. And I, I think we are underselling ourselves. It's a great team. Well, it's a great way to, to wrap this up with a comment from Conley, who says, simply welcome, congratulations, wonderful having another botanist on board. I look forward <laughs> to meeting you in person, working with you in the future via the General Assembly and perhaps in the field. So I think, Zach, you have a lot of goodwill going into this. And I would simply say, you know, as a, as a storyteller myself, you have a hell of a story to tell. 
the work that uh, is done there and the the magic of the place and the attention that you've got and the expertise that you bring and the cultures and the disciplines that that you represent and bring together i wish you all the very best and um you know yeah think big go big it's a, it's a good thing it's a great thing thanks frank and, and good and luck thanks for 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 this time oh it's it's been a it's been a great pleasure and i look forward to more hans I'll, I'll i'll hand it back over to you for some closing remarks and Thank you for letting me be part of this conversation. It's been just fascinating. Yeah. Um, I can only both of you, uh, well, thank you for uh, what I would say is a, a riveting conversation. And uh, yeah, um, very insightful. Um, and I hope that um, our GA members um, have found this meeting as um, instructive as I did. So join me in wishing Zach a great, successful, and uh, also very important happy time with <laughs> the Charles Darwin Foundation. And to the GA members, I trust you will support him in every step of the way. Thank you for spending time with us and Please stay healthy and stay safe. Ciao. Thank you all. And thanks to the team.